Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields on the program today. Fred Rouse, winemaker from El Dorado County and uh, the candidate for the, uh, the uh, uh, Yuba County Board of Supervisors, David Joyce. Welcome to the show. I uh, you. appreciate you being here. Uh, the uh, Parkland shooting has been in the news well ever since it happened, and I'm kind of curious as to why it's been in the news for you know basically nonstop ever since it happened. And the uh, the Sutherland Springs story died as soon as uh, an NRA member killed the perp. Uh, that that that's always you know been mysterious to me. But another mystery is this: there was a deputy on the scene in Parkland who uh, heard the shots and took a defensive position, didn't go into the school, has since resigned in disgrace. And the question that I have is he's supposedly going to be getting a $52,000 per year pension for life plus half of his medical expenses. What's going on in, what's going on in, in Florida? Yeah, that's interesting. The Parkland uh, shooting occurred and there was this school resource officer who'd been employed as a, a full-time employee of the Broward County Sheriff's Department as a school uh, since 1985 in the Sheriff's Department since 2008 I believe as the school resource officer so, so he's was, a sheriff's deputy his, assigned to school resource officer. yeah it was his job to be on the campus during school hours and um, you know Valentine's Day when the shooting occurred is typically a day when uh, there's going to be more fights between boys than other days because they're fighting over the, you know, their true love or whatever. I mean, that's just the case historically. So there's no excuse for him not to be kind of on the scene that day. Um, but yeah, the bigger question is, you know, wh what does somebody have to do as a police officer to lose their pension? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> dereliction of duty apparently isn't enough. There's a very small category of crimes. You have to basically that, be a felon and, and a special kind of felon. Yeah, yeah, you can't just fall asleep on the job and lose yeah. your pension and, right. and you know have 17 people murdered. It's got to be much worse than that. Yeah. I mean, you have to you know do something really bad. But I mean, the bigger picture of the public safety pensions is one. I do I do not begrudge firemen or police officers. I mean, they signed up for a job that a lot of people don't want or couldn't do, and their pension is what was part of the bargain when they um, when they agreed to their employment, and they served their 25 or 35 or however many years. Usually, it's 30 years to get full funding, full vesting in their in their public pensions. But the, the, the bigger question of the entire public pension scheme is really one that um, it's a promise that we're probably not going to be able to keep. Um, probably. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's just like a lot of the other things that we as the more mature members of our society have decided to kick the can down the road. It was an easy choice for politicians and government agencies to agree to these um, contracts at the time they were issued back in the 80s and 90s and yeah. and to make these promises to their employees but um, there we're, we're gonna have to pay the piper and there's just not going to be the money there well yeah pay. I mean I mean the, the pension the whole pension programs are whether it's anything from Social Security to uh, uh, CalPERS how's the, how's the pension program in Yuba County oh, god awful okay Calper, CalPERS is it's CalPERS. CalPERS is Board of Supervisors too by the way okay so we're so part here's of the thing here's the thing we have uh, a government that says, or we, ha we have government-run pensions that say, well, historically, we've been able to get 8% per year with a combination of half stocks and half bonds. So we're going to do all of our planning based on you know, uh, an annualized return of 8% per year. Meanwhile, another branch of government, the Federal Reserve Board, has driven interest rates on bonds on the 10-year treasury is down to under 3%. It was down to as low as just a little over 1% a couple of years ago. Wait a minute. One, per, one or two percent yield on bonds and eight percent assumed return on pensions. That means that stocks, if they're part of the uh, portfolio, would have to return like 20 percent in order for that eight percent to be missed. What's wrong with this every picture? Year. What's, every year. Yeah, yeah, every year. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? Anybody with any sense of financial uh, smarts at all knows that this is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. There's no way that this can last. And Surprise, surprise, Social Security has said that, uh, that Social Security will be broke or will, be ha will have to reduce payouts, I think, in, in 2034. That's actuarially. 
uh, really they're already starting to pay out. I think they're already start, well, no, I think they start to pay out more than they're taking in mm -hmm. in 2013. They're going to raise retirement ages. And they'll, yeah, they'll, they'll have to they'll have to make adjustments. Medicare is the biggest obligation. Uh, Medicare is even worse. Huge. Yeah, it's Medicare huge. is even worse. And Calpers used to be one of the best run pension company uh, systems in the in the in the uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. Well, one of the things with Calpers is when you make promises you can't keep. One of the things that I qualify for, which I've always found ridiculous. I can apply my military service time to CalPERS for a residual payment. There's mathematically that makes no sense whatsoever. So it's one of those things where well, equitably it makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> no, it doesn't. And, and what, one of the things though too with this whole uh, deputy pension thing, I find really interesting. If you make the parallel off the top of my head, I think that if you get a felony as a retired uh, service member, they can garnish your um, pay. But I know like David Petraeus. They went after him really hard to try to get him uh, to get like a portion or all of his pension taken away. So it's one of these things where why is it that, that law enforcement isn't held to the same standard military is? Never mind a, a state employee or anything else. It's it's like, a special case. Remember yeah. O.J. Simpson? They you yeah. know when they went after him, they couldn't get his pension. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, it, and even like look at the NFL, I mean, with all the concussion stuff, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, once you get one of those, you're on it for life, you know, and you're going to get a paycheck regardless of what happens. And that's pretty much guaranteed in the mm -hmm. NFL. Mm -hmm. Well, initially when this story was reported to, it was that he wasn't on site that day. And then, Except he was. And then they say he was, and, and Scott uh, Israel, the sheriff of Broward County, which Who is like the, real the largest sheriff's department in the country, by the way. It's huge. But anyway... Um, Israel came on and says he had a video of Scott Peterson on the site, but he wasn't willing to show it. And I'm not, you know, I'm not sure exactly what happened that day um, because the stories conflict. But um, the uh, the 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 fact that the guy was allowed, the Scott Peterson, the sheriff's deputy, was allowed, the school resource officer was allowed to resign. I mean, why not suspend him and do an investigation and then determine the status of his pension? Why just allow him to resign if he was, you know, hiding out while there was a mass shooting going on? I mean, that's kind of crazy too. You mm -hmm. accept his resignation? Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. Doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know. Sounds fishy. Yeah. Well, there's a lot, of, a lot of things fishy about all of these uh, mass, mass shootings, and mm -hmm. not to mention the fact that uh, we have uh, causal factors of mass shootings. Among the causal factors uh, that uh, people have brought up, one that I don't necessarily agree with, as a violent media have something to do with it, I'm not sure that's ca that the case, but another one that I think is absolutely the case is that uh, pharmaceuticals like uh, SSRIs lead to violent and suicidal behavior among uh, their, uh, the patients that use them. And, uh, you know, there, there are other things going on that have, well, that's the main one that's been going, that was, you know, drug usage by the perpetrator is, a, was, is alleged mm -hmm. in Parkland, it was alleged in uh, Columbine, it, it's been alleged in a whole, I think, a whole bunch of other different uh, mass shootings. Almost all of them. So all if all we're looking them. at a cause for people to go wacko and start shooting up uh, basically going into shooting galleries, which any place with a any place with a gun-free zone is a shooting gallery. I mean, mm -hmm. nobody can shoot back. It's, it's a shooting gallery. It's, you know, it's... Uh, I, I think there's a couple factors, though, too, that a lot of people aren't talking about. Like I, I was saying earlier uh, today to some people, I applaud Governor Bevin for taking the control of the narrative on this. Um, for me personally, my, Bevin of, of Kentucky, okay. uh, he's basically talked about the, the psych meds and being a factor and whatnot. Uh, I, I had two incidents that happened to me. Um, I went to a, Assemblyman Gallagher's uh, town hall back in like November-ish, and they were talking about the Tehama shooter, and they were talking about the Vegas shooter. And when the Vegas shooting happened, uh, my sister texted me, it was like you know, 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning or whatever, hey, there's a huge shooting in Las Vegas or whatever. I rolled over and literally said to my wife, I said, I guarantee you this guy was on some sort of psych med, and I guarantee you he was overprescribed. Two weeks later, it comes out that he basically doubled his Valium dosage within the last year or whatever. Um, Mother's me, little helper. Yeah. Diazepam. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the, the thing that's crazy about it, though, is from my background, my mother's a nurse, uh, my grandmother was a nurse, my sister's a nurse practitioner. We have had this conversation about kicking the can down the road and not coping with anything, it's a lot easier to write a script 
than it is to make someone cope with something. So in our family for 20 years, we've been saying, hey, it's the psych meds, it's the psych meds, it's the psych meds. Matt Bevan brought up the other day, how many people at the end of the commercial for Valium or whatever it says may cause uh, harmful thoughts or, or suicidal tendencies or impulse control issues or whatever. All said so fast you can't understand any of it. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, we've all, everyone in America re resonates with that. But one of the things I want to bring up that a lot of people don't talk about, I spoke at a high school in my district yesterday. And it went incredibly well. But when I talked about the, the, to the teachers there, they obviously brought up the school shootings and the talk of bringing you know, military personnel and all that stuff and everything. And when they brought up a factor that I've known about for a long time and I've been very vocal about, it, they said, David, it's, we have a culture problem. It's not a gun problem. Guns have been in America before 1776. Schools have been in America before 1776. The problem is psych meds, but even a bigger problem is is the breakdown of the family structure. They're like, these kids in these classrooms, the, the ones that scare us the most, are the kids that don't have a dad at home. And we know there's not a dad at home. They're like, you're, the removal of the father from the you know family structure in America, there's tons of studies on it. Uh, Larry Elder talks about it ad nauseum. Um, it's one of these things where I think that's a huge factor too, that we need to start talking about cultural issues rather than inanimate objects. Well, and we have a, a welfare uh, a human services yes. structure that yep. encourages no father in the home. Oh, yep. It makes it more profitable for mm -hmm. a woman. Uh, to, to marry the government. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, maybe I'm a sissy or whatever, but I do want to, you skipped over the whole, me the effect of media on leading to this kind of event. I think that in order for somebody to commit a violent act with a weapon like that, three things are required. More than, the first one obviously is the weapon. The second is you need the skill to use the weapon. And then you need the will. You need to have somewhere you've got a breakdown of uh, empathy or compassion or connection to other human beings where you can completely dissociate in their humanity mm -hmm. and you can kill them, which is what we teach soldiers, which is necessary on the battlefield. But when you are exposed to messages of mass destruction in the media that all the superhero, you know, it, the good guy always wins, so it's okay, but... I mean, I don't like to watch football anymore. I used to like it, but it turns me off now to watch people get hurt. I don't care. I mean, I, it just, and that's, I'm a sissy. But you can't tell me that playing these um, video games, Call to Duty and all that genre of video games where people are actually shooting and they're aiming and they're, I mean, they're practicing killing people. That's what they're doing. The whole, that's what the game is. They're involved in that process. It's got to yeah. desensitize. At a minimum, it has to desensitize the gamer. That's, that. that's certainly one side of the argument, but you could also make the counter argument that people who have that proclivity, the proclivity to want to, to, be, to act out violently, if they're doing it on a video game, that's a heck of a lot uh, better than if they were doing it in real life. And I'm sure that, that happens. Well, that, I've too. heard this argument relative to the you know, vo all volunteer armed forces. People that sign up are the ones with that proclivity, and they potentially get killed or trained or disciplined or whatever that removes that violent segment of the poor population from the streets and it's one of the re re reasons for the decline in violent crime rates nationwide in the last mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years. I had not I mean, heard that argument. Yeah, yeah I mean, does it make sense or what? Intuitively, yeah, I guess, it makes sense. Makes sense well, and, the, and one of the last things I want to add on to that, though, is that, you know, part of the culture problem, we never use timelines. So one of the things, whenever the gun issue comes up to me, I say, you know, Explain this timeline because we had guns in schools in America before 1776. Yeah. Our first shooter was Texas Austin. Then we go a good 25, almost 30 years to Lindhurst, the high school that I spoke at yesterday. And then we had Columbine. Now we're having them basically every month, if not every week. So what is it about the gun that, you know, all of a sudden now it's the gun causing it? It's not. It's a yeah. cultural issue. Well, and then and, and it's also media piling on. Yes. I think the more publicity that... Something like and fame, yeah, it's fame. Uh, they're uh, yeah. looking for the fame part or infamy. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that that's part of it. But yeah, another part uh, is uh, that uh, the, the 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 weapon of choice changes over time. I'm old enough to remember when the villainous weapon was the Saturday Night Special, mm -hmm. the snub nose pi pistol. That because you could conceal it. That was what you had to get rid of. You know, get rid of the Saturday Night Specials and all will be well. It's okay that you know you can't shoot a bear with a hunting rifle or with a snub nose pistol. You need, you need a rifle for that. So keep rifles, that's, they're used for hunting, but no pistols. 
Now it's the other way around. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, the, the, the rifles, particularly if it's a rapid fire rifle of one kind or another, that's what's dangerous. Well, they're all dangerous. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, 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 a, it's a fad, whatever is, is considered to be the most dangerous. But the underlying goal of all of the uh, anti-gun people is to get, you know, to basically disarm America. And I would argue that the underlying reason for that is that the people who are the sociopaths who want to be in control of government, Mm -hmm. And I would say that probably a good majority of people who go into politics, you, President Company accepted, yes. <laughs> are going into it for sociopathic reasons because they like control. Uh, and people who like control don't like people that resist that control. Mm -hmm. That's why Stalin, Hitler, Lenin, Pol Pot, 169 million people were killed by governments yes, in the 20th sure. century. By governments, not yeah. by... Uh, Saturday Night Specials or, mm -hmm. or Uzis or uh, AR-15s by the government basically shoot them in the back of the head after they made them dig their own grave. That's the kind of reason why people need to be armed, to be able mm -hmm. to resist that kind but, of tyranny. And even the, 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 old, old, the old cliche that I bring up to people when they try to talk about gun control, I say, listen, uh, there's a cliche about a scalpel. A scalpel in the hands of a doctor is a great thing. A scalpel in the hands of a crazy serial killer is a bad thing. It's still yeah. the same scalpel. Yeah. You know, so. And if you're talking about things that can kill mm -hmm. lots of people, we've had pretty good examples that uh, trucks fall into that category. Timothy McVeigh didn't use a gun. Uh, yeah, but, or explosives, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was a homemade explosive that mm -hmm. he put together, and anybody could do it, or anybody with a little bit of uh, you know, knowledge could do it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay. Guns, booze, war, abortion, voting, how old is old enough? One of the big calls that we're hearing now is that this guy was, <coughs> excuse me, 19, so we've got to raise the age to buy a gun to 21 or 25 or 75, I don't know. What's the reason for having various ages for doing various things? I've never been able to figure that out. It's hard to distinguish. Um, to, to, to make one blanket rule for, that applies to all people is obviously arbitrary because some people are, um, everybody, mental development and maturation and, and their level of responsibility varies greatly. Um, I'd say it should be 18 for, for women and 21 for men. I mean, if you just look scientifically, you could do that. You could say, well, let's make it, let's make it 18 for everything um, but then there's some kids that are exceptional because, you know, you, generally you want to keep the vices out of the high school campus, right? You don't want people coming to school drunk for their senior year in high school so, um, or, or packing guns in their car or whatever. So maybe you say um, 18 or 19, but then if you graduate from high school early because you're an exceptional student and you want to go on to college and you're really driven and motivated and all that, maybe when you graduate from high school or 18 whichever is first or maybe you do that but there's so many there's so many conflicting issues here like we we decide that you know um girls in some states they don't have to talk to their parents if they're a teenager and they need birth control or an abortion in other states they need parental approval or consent um, and the age uh, you know the age of consent for uh, sexual activity varies, varies from state 16 to state. 6 17 18 it 14 varies. in the south it 14 in the south that we we decide we've decided as a society that if we have a teenager that commits a violent crime they can be tried in, as an adult in adult court down to the age of 13 or 14 well what's or, or that or less in some states yeah i mean that that makes no sense if you're going to say they're not they don't have they're not mature enough or responsible enough to to smoke or drink or buy a gun or vote or join the military, but we're going to hold you accountable as an adult for the crime you committed. That's hypocritical as well. So I, there's certainly no good answer, but it would make sense to put one, one across the board number on all of those kind of what we consider to be adult, responsible, adult functioning type of things. And of course, you can you can dig in and say, "Well, I don't want people voting unless they, you know, own property or whatever." Well, that was the I was started out in this country. I know, <laughs> I know. I wouldn't go that far. Um, uh, uh, speaking of schools and uh, you know the snowflakes, uh, there's a school in England, which uh, in which the, uh, the the headmaster this is England, all right, after all, the headmaster has said it is against the rules in this school to touch snow. Because, of course, if you touch snow, you may make a snowball and you may put a stone in that snowball and hit somebody in the eye. So we're going to prevent the escalation of 
eyeball loss by pro prohibiting touching of snow. Mm -hmm. Well, you Is know, this taking the snowflake analogy way too far? You know, it's really, uh, go ahead. <laughs> it, it, I think the thing is, you know, this is this is their version of what in America we would call taking away dodgeball. You know, where, where I grew up when we played dodgeball and then they kind of got rid of it and phased it out or whatever. It, it goes to a larger thing with our media and like culture where we're, we're raising a generation of kids that don't know how to cope with anything. They don't know how to cope with any failure. And I joke around with them. I'm like, listen, you know, wait till you have to pay taxes or like get in a fight or something. Like things are bad things happen to everyone. And it's one of those things where you have this this blanket culture now, and especially in England. England is I think England whenever they talk about America, the California comes first and then the rest of the country follows. I think England pretty much is the, the, the opposite spectrum of that. Like whatever something happens in England, it comes to America, you know? So it's one of those things where a lot of it, um, a lot of it goes back to, to where uh, Glenn Beck often talks about who, which kid at the table gets attention, the honor roll student or the whiny child. So a lot of it is, you know, there's a lot of AstroTurf stuff behind it too, where it's, Either the, the school has an agenda of like a policy, like if they want to like have a liberal slant of things where they're doing these type of things, but also too, it's like there's there's people behind these type of things that I think with the policies. So like you take something um, like there's a lot of like grassroots or like astroturf things with the schools that they're trying to do like the safe zones, and uh, like uh, those things didn't just come up out of thin air. There was someone behind that. So. I think the snow thing probably falls into that category too, that there's someone trying to push that, push that bar even further down the road that we can use political correctness to control people and what they can and can't do. So it's touching snow one day and then it's gonna be, oh, you're not allowed to you know, ride the bus or, or the, play the any sports or anything. You can't come to school in the, uh, wet because- Yeah, yeah, well, it's raining out today. Everyone needs to stay home. That's, that'll be the next thing, yeah. you know? I have a funny story. The last big snowstorm, the sea level in the Bay Area, was in 1976, and I was in eighth grade, John F. Kennedy Junior High School, just down the road from Apple in Cupertino, and um, and it snowed a couple inches, and we got to school, and there's this giant field, the grass field, and there were a couple inches of snow, and the kids all ran out there before class. And it was like 7:30 in the morning. It was in February, and the sun was out. It was gorgeous. Well, the principal turned on the sprinklers, <laughs> melted the snow, turned on the sprinklers so we didn't want to go play in the snow, you know. So this isn't just a new thing. I mean, it's a certain mm -hmm. mindset. And honestly, there's another factor here, too, which is um, we're so litigious and everybody's concerned about liability and getting sued and parents complaining and, you know, oh, my kid got hit by a snowball or whatever. Everybody's so... Um, willing to blame other people for getting wet or mm -hmm. getting hurt mm -hmm. or well, it, whatever. It, it's it's the absence of personal responsibility. It I mean, is. You ever been to a school playground? They have sponges for the you know the surface area. They don't have slides or teeter totters or uh, swings anymore because they're too dangerous. Uh, you know, you end right. up with essentially we, nothing. We had a couple of years ago. My wife and I took my daughter up to I, I believe it's in Placerville or whatever, uh, Daffodil Hill. We drive all the way up there, and they had to like gated off the thing. And they said, "Oh, we're closed for the day." And they started yelling at everybody. We're like, "Why?" And they said, "Oh, it's raining out. There's too much mud. Someone uh, slipped uh, in the uh, mud and uh, sued uh, them." Uh, 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 and so it's one of those things where it, you know the, yeah. what he's saying about the litigation is a huge part of it, I think, too. Yeah, yeah. So it's sad. It's sad. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Canada. Our next uh, uh, object of ridicule: a cancer survivor in in Canada. Uh, decided she would give back, and so she decided she would do so by giving $12 rides to cancer uh, victims to and from the hospital, which was, I, I'm sure, below the cost of what a taxi or an Uber or whatever would cost. So she was doing a public service, she was helping out, and uh, in doing so, she was, she was the victim of a sting operation by the cops, who uh, nailed her for, what, like, uh, hauling people without a license or some damn thing. Yeah, wow. it, it's um, you wonder if they're in cahoots with. It's it's kind of a rehash of the ta of the taxi cab Uber wars, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you wonder if they're the cab companies talking to the chief of police and hey, we can't have these people, man. We're losing a fare. But um, I think the way you have to you have to play all kinds of games to get around this now, mm -hmm. um, to get 
re remunerated for your gas costs. You have to ask for a donation maybe. Or maybe instead of asking for $12 for the round trip ride that she provides to a cancer treatment patient to, to and from the hospital, she says, oh, I have these water bottles and um, <laughs> everybody I, I give water. a ride drinks mm -hmm. one and they're $12 yeah, know, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a, the water. Well, and then there's people in some, in some localities that are getting busted for food, serving food to the homeless because they don't have a, yeah. a licensed kitchen or, or whatever. Uh, right. A couple of years ago, I went to McKinley Park right down the street here and they have a huge sign with a fine that you're not allowed to give bread to the, the birds because they were mutating. So and I said to people, I said to people, I said, uh, so, the, so the same bread that were Benjamin Franklin was feeding the birds. Where are these birds with three heads? You know, I was like, where are they? You know. And then my daughter says to me, she goes, Daddy, if if that's what's happening to the to the birds, what's going to happen to us for eating the bread? <laughs> <laughs> so it's crazy. It's totally crazy. Yeah. Well, and only in a society that was relatively affluent and violence free would the cops have any time to spend. You know, running sting operations on little old ladies giving rides to Or maybe, we have, or maybe we have way too many cops. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe so. Um, we have a celebrity culture. I mean, you say what you want about Donald Trump. He was a reality TV star and a self-made celebrity. No, no question about it. The next celebrity candidate, if God asks her, is Oprah. How do we feel about an President I Oprah Winfrey? I find this fascinating because one, I, I agree, I think I told people with Trump, his name ID was probably the highest of any person who's ever run for the presidency in the United States. There wasn't a person in America who didn't know who he was. I think there's a significant difference between Donald Trump and Oprah though, and I'll point them out. One, Trump was in the public eye, but he was also attacked. He was attacked on his show, he was attacked in the real estate business, real estate business was cutthroat, his dad was five times more cutthroat than he is, right? Oprah, for, for the better or worse, she's never had that type of backswing. Everyone's kind of, oh, well, she's, You've never you been know. in the media business, have you? <laughs> well, well, here's the thing, though, is, <laughs> that, is that with her, though, it's like, okay, we're making all this money. We, we're going to do our own network. We're going to become a billionaire and everything else. There's a couple factors here that you have to go into play. Number one, you have to be willing to, to leave that alone and, and to not... You can't be the president and run your, your company anymore, right? Trump decided to, hey, let's have my kids take it over or whatever, right? The second part of that is um, one thing I had this conversation yesterday with someone, regardless of what people think of Trump, if you're a history, uh, like a political historian, and you can see some things that he incorporated, no one told him to do. So there's two things that I think that he did in the campaign that was fantastic, was that he took basically Huey Long and blended that with um, William Jennings Bryan. I said, I said because w w if you look at the rallies and everything. Two and stuff, of the worst populists in history. Yes. Yeah, I'll go along with that. And, and, and combining <laughs> the two of them, though, I said, you know, look, if you look, it's clear as day that he researched and knew about both those guys and implemented into the campaign. Or he just came by it naturally. I'm not yeah. and, and, and Oprah's whole thing is that, you know what, it's one thing, and, I'll, and I, I've learned this just even on the county level. I've told people running for office, I said, running for office is translating emotion all day long. <laughs> Thank you very much for being part of the show. We'll see you again next week. Same time, same place. Good to you. Yeah, I tell people all the time that I say, you know, when you run for offices, they